The following video contains references to sexual violence. Viewer discretion is advised. The question beneath the question remains the same. All right. What's the question? Which one of you will hurt me? Woman of the Hour is the long-awaited directorial debut of Anna Kendrick, one of my favorites, but someone whose easy affable charm, I'll admit, feels a bit processed. Much like a distaff Ryan Reynolds, she's just always on. It's the charisma of a class clown who uses laughs to put up a wall. I wouldn't want to be there when, when the laughter stops. <laughs> but Kendrick probably recognizes that there are more stakes in the freezer if she fulfills the fantasy of the cool girl. This is not to say that she's being phony, only that she purposefully keeps one aspect of her personality front-facing at all times because that's what the audience wants to see. And while the press is reported on feuds with co-star Blake Lively and romances with Edgar Wright and Bill Hader, Kendrick has remained remarkably disciplined, letting the embers of paparazzi interest die out. People have made me aware that I'm on lists. <laughs> but they don't consult you at all. <laughs> I don't have to sleep with him, Trevor. I bring all this up because control over how you are perceived is at the heart of Woman of the Hour. Remember to please like the video and to subscribe to the channel. The film has a messy backstory, as Ian McDonald's screenplay Rodney and Cheryl made the 2017 blacklist of the best unproduced screenplays floating around Hollywood. It was acquired by Netflix, who let it slip away and then reacquired it. It lost director Chloe Akuno, who made the underappreciated Micah Monroe thriller Watcher. Kendrick wound up replacing Akuno to save the project. And to top it all off, during the initial promotion of the film, the actor strike hit, meaning Kendrick had to skip her own premiere. The lost time has forced Kendrick to hit the ground running in recent weeks to promote the film, which she also has a stake in. And that's created a sort of trap where people expect her to be the funny, cool girl in interviews while promoting a film about a real-life serial killer. Hey, I'm Anna Kendrick. I'm Catherine Gallagher. And we're playing yeah. How I'm Why Are You in Batches? Batches? And there's an image that I will never forget. It's an image of this pipe used to, to, to strangle her with, essentially. Press it against her throat. It threatens to fall into the It Ends With Us trap, where Blake Lively's Sisters Before Misters, Wine Mom, You'll Live, Laugh, Love This Movie About Domestic Abuse, made her the book talk villain while sitting in the same room as Colleen Hoover. A feat I didn't even think was possible. And all this pressure to be the perfect actress, parasocial girlfriend, girl you don't have to worry about, brand ambassador, and spokesmodel, actually makes Kendrick the perfect director and star for Woman of the Hour. A film very loosely inspired by the case of Rodney Alcala, who took time out of a murder spree to go on the dating game. Where he was, of course, affable, charming, and always on, because that's what the audience wanted to see. Well, I like bananas, so I'll take one. Number one! That's your number one, all right. I'm about to pick some spoilers, so if you don't want to go on that date, you can accept the lovely parting gift of a thank you for watching this far. Loved this video. Share it with your friends. While the film recalls another thriller from earlier this year in which an episode of a 1970s TV show plays a big role, Woman of the Hour only pays lip service to the actual episode. Using it more as a framing device interspersed with the counts of Alcala's other killings and attempts to evade the police. In fact, most of the film is simply a repurposed series of women's experiences navigating a man's world with Alcala's infamous appearance merely being the connective tissue. Considering that, Woman of the Hour is a film that is ultimately about how men's egos are prioritized over women's safety, how women often do that to themselves, and how it can be weaponized by men who seek to do them harm. The thriller is just a spoonful of sugar that helps the medicine of gender-like theory go down. Nowhere is that more apparent than in the film's cold open, which sees serial killer Rodney taking pictures of a lovely young woman in an idyllic roadside setting. As she shares about the troubles with her boyfriend and her parents, it's clear that she just needs someone to listen, and Rodney fulfills that purpose. Until he doesn't. And it's the moment where she realizes that her vulnerability was her last mistake that provides the real horror of the scene. This is a striking moment, beautifully rendered by barbarian cinematographer Zach Cooperstein, and expertly paced by Kendrick, because we all know what is coming, but 
showing Sarah's face as it dawns on her that she's alone with a strange man in a remote setting with no one to hear her scream is powerful, and it makes the scene hers rather than his. This is followed immediately by a pair of casting directors discussing how angry and unsympathetic a female actress was, before pulling back to reveal that they're talking about Kendrick Cheryl Bradshaw, thus proving my point that there is at least the perception that actresses, or women in general, are expected to act as a joy supplement for people who aren't getting enough. After an awkward exchange, she tells the casting director that she isn't comfortable with nude scenes, and that pretty much seals her fate. This is 1978, after all, and you can just imagine one of the notes on her being difficult to work with, although her agent tells her they thought she was just not passionate enough about the project. The first act, which differs heavily from McDonald's screenplay, continues to embody most of the familiar circumstances women recognize in existing in a man's world. Women rarely get enough eye contact when they speak, women are often forced to occupy smaller spaces and let more people into them, Men pay less attention to nonverbal cues than women do. Women tend to focus more on the establishment and preservation of relationships than men do. Cheryl experiences all of these as the two male casting directors didn't even bother looking at her when she was reading for the audition. Her overfamiliar neighbor Terry refuses to take the hint when Cheryl says that she has to take a call. Terry. Oh yeah. And then he sulks when his romantic advances don't go anywhere. And Cheryl feels so bad about not being receptive to that that she sleeps with them out of pity and immediately regrets it. A lot of this happens because men and women speak different dialects of the same language. Of course, this is a generalization, and like all science, there are going to be outliers. But in general, women are socialized to prioritize nurture and connection, while men are socialized to prioritize competition and independence. This leads men and women to develop different ways to communicate, both verbally and non. Neither dialect is right or wrong, there's just language sets that reflect our experiences. But it can be incredibly frustrating when you can't communicate with someone who speaks another language. It would be great if someone with influence could just say that. But instead we have the BuzzFeed style mid-teens criticisms of why all men are idiots on one side, and the Sneeko Andrew Tate cesspool on the other. Have you ever seen a woman try and do anything competently? How much money would it take to make you spend a night in a cemetery? The consequence is that men don't have a language that can express fear, disgust, sadness, or attraction with any kind of nuance, and women don't have a language that can express firm boundaries. We have to borrow each other's language, and just like trying to speak any language that is foreign to us, we're not good at it. It's why Cheryl doesn't tell Terry to leave her apartment when she takes the call from her agent, and why Terry's come-ons are so clumsy. Oh, that just took me by surprise. Um. Terry's not a bad guy, he just doesn't speak the language. And since this story is from Cheryl's point of view, he comes off as just another frustrating example of a man in her life who won't listen. The real problem comes when someone does speak the language enough for us to connect with them. Like, it's so hard to meet people, you know, that you can connect with. Now would be a good time to start thinking of a comment. It's called a confidence game. Why? Because you give me your confidence? No, because I give you mine. There's this photo contest that I want to enter and I've been looking for a subject. I think you'd be perfect for it. Desperate to salvage her flailing career, Cheryl agrees to be cast on the dating game, a syndication staple of the 1970s and 80s. Despite the show's outward presentation of a simple blind date setup show, it was the launching ground for many pre-famed superstars. Please join me in a special dating game welcome for a fine young man, Michael Jackson. Typically, the show featured young adults saying horny, quagmire-level things to one another for the amusement of the after-school audience. Still don't understand. What does it mean, hanky-panky? Of course, no one at the show listens to Cheryl either, as the production manager has to ask her if she needs a water twice because she didn't listen to the answer the first time. And fictional host Ed Burke, played by a perfectly smarmy Tony Hale, mistakenly asks her about her experience at Juilliard, only to continue talking past her as if she didn't correct him. At this point, there might as well be a flashing light over Cheryl's head that says, character need, someone to listen. I just love it so much. You could look up from the table when I'm reading the scene. It's not subtle. Burke also tells her that if she's too smart, she'll intimidate the guys. So she should just smile and laugh as much as possible. 
That's a lot harder than it sounds, given that the bachelors don't give her much to work with. In fact, Alcala is charming only by default in the first round. It's not until the makeup lady tells Cheryl to ignore Burke's admonition to dumb it down that Alcala pulls away from the pack. But of course, he would be charming because it's not an adjective, it's a verb. The genius of the screenplay is that it treats the episode as a countdown clock to a bomb going off. Before filming, we're introduced to the character of Laura, played by Nicolette Robinson. Laura is an audience member whose friend Allison was murdered by Alcala the previous year, and she blames herself for leaving Allison with a total stranger. When she recognizes Alcala as bachelor number three, she has a panic attack and frustratingly gets gaslighted by her boyfriend. I'm just saying this guy might look really similar, right? After which she rushes to find security. Since bachelor number three is far and away the winner, it's a race against the clock to see what will happen first. Will Laura convince someone that Alcala is the killer? Or will the show end with Cheryl going off with Rodney and probably to her demise? Well, if you've been paying attention to the thesis of the film, you know exactly how much Laura is going to be listened to. Not only as a woman, but as a woman of color in 1978. But the way we find out how little she's listened to might have you screaming at the screen. I'm supposed to meet with someone named George Elliott. I'm George Elliott. Cheryl agrees to have a drink with Rodney after the show, and all goes well until Rodney starts getting weird and vaguely hostile in a way that's hard to describe. But what I appreciate about the film is that it foreshadowed this kind of hostility in Cheryl's first scene with the casting director. It says here that you did your BFA in acting at Columbia. I have a friend who went through that program. We might know each other. Kevin Wetmore. Mm, he might have been before me. How do you know he wasn't after you? Hmm. A good conversation has a flow, like an improv scene. And when someone sandbags the flow instead of yes anding you, it gets uncomfortable in a hurry. I don't date much. But you decided to go to the dating game. This leads to an excruciating walk through the parking lot in which Rodney baits her into revealing she gave him a bum number and then stalks her as she walks to her car. Again, this is a scene that was foreshadowed in the opening of the film as both Sarah and Cheryl have medium close-ups where the actress's negative acting is on display. Negative acting is an old Hollywood term that means the emotion of the scene isn't indicated by an expression on someone's face. It's indicated by someone's face going from expressive to vacant. The absence of the expression creates a sort of negative space that the viewer backfills with the opposite emotion. It lets the audience do the work and therefore get more invested in the performance. Joy becomes anger, fear becomes strength, and comfort becomes unease. Who is the lucky lady? I apologize for depriving you of your companion in this abrupt way. In the end, Rodney is undone by the very thing that made him a successful killer. He trusts the wrong person. And one of the few things the film faithfully kept from true life, one of Rodney's victims asks him not to tell anyone that they had sex. Not merely throwing herself on his mercy, but indicating to him that she perceived the sex to be consensual and openly asking him for help in hiding her shameful act. Something that Rodney connects with. It's called a confidence game. Why? Because you give me your confidence? No, because I give you mine. Instead, she runs the first chance she gets, and Rodney is finally arrested after years of stalking, raping, and murdering women. He was convicted of killing eight women in 1980 and died in prison in 2021, 43 years after appearing on The Dating Game. Woman of the Hour is not a true crime retelling of the case. It's an exploration of women existing in men's spaces. There are multiple instances of poetic license to make the point. It may remind some people of David Fincher's film Zodiac at times. Though Fincher's goal with that film was to wring thrills out of a meticulous recreation of real life events. Kendrick's goal is to tap into a cultural narrative about how women are treated and listened to in our society. In that sense, the film has much more in common with films like Looking for Mr. Goodbar than the standard true crime narrative we become used to. And if you're more concerned with Rodney Alcala being bachelor number one in real life than you are with what Kendrick has to say, well, you're just proving her point. Stay hydrated, stay safe, wash your hands, return your shopping carts, and I'll see you next time. <laughs>